virtually all the vertebrae can look a little bit like animals. We're going to take, for example, this cervical vertebrae. And this little guy looks a little bit like a fox. Can you see his nose? Imagine his little ears here. And put a couple eyes here, and at least in this area, right there. And you can imagine a little fox. This one, on the other hand, looks a little bit like an elephant. And that is cervical vertebrae number six. Um, especially if we got rid of this part of the bifurcation. So, of course, what makes these vertebrae unique, once again, is the presence of these transverse foramen. This is a thoracic vertebrae, and as with some of the other vertebrae we've seen, this resembles an animal. In this particular case, I think it resembles a giraffe. Let's take a look at the parts of the giraffe and relate those to the parts of the vertebrae. The nose of the giraffe is the spinous process. Then we have the lamina. And we go over here to the ears of the giraffe. And these ears, of course, would be transverse processes. The horns of the giraffe would be the superior articular surfaces. Now, of course, there's some other parts that we know are common to all vertebrae. Here's the hole that the spinal cord passes through, and that's referred to as the vertebral foramen. And of course, there's the body as well, or we've been also calling it the centrum. The place where the head of the giraffe is attached to the body is called the pedicle. And of course, this is common to all vertebrae. If we flip the vertebrae over, we also see the uh, inferior articular surfaces, which are right here. And of course, they're quite plain. And if we spin our giraffe back again, we see that these areas would essentially be the cheeks of the giraffe. All right, there are some things that are unique to the thoracic vertebrae, and that is the presence of facets or articulating surfaces that we have with the ribs. Notice that there is a facet here on the transverse process, and then we have what looks like a partial facet here and here on the body. These are referred to as demifacets. The tubercle of the rib will articulate here at the facet on the transverse process, whereas the heads of the ribs will articulate in the demifacets. And I'm going to show you why we basically have two heads articulating in uh, the area of one body. So perhaps two heads are better than one. We're looking at the thoracic vertebrae as they're articulating with the rib cage, and you can see that in the upper ribs, we have almost a one-to-one -one relationship between the articulation of the rib and the vertebrae. But as we work our way lower down, while the tubercle of the rib is articulating with the transverse process of the thoracic vertebrae, the head of the rib is going to be articulating between the two vertebrae. So oftentimes we refer to these as demi-facets. In other words, the articular surfaces uh, that the vertebrae have on their bodies um, to articulate with the ribs. Let's take a look over here. This is a loose rib. And so we can see the tubercle of the rib, which is articulating with the transverse process, which would be here. And then we have the neck of the rib and the head of the rib. The head of the rib is articulating with the body of the thoracic vertebrae. Here's a disarticulated rib, and we can see the head of the rib, the neck of the rib, and the tubercle of the rib. Recall that the tubercle of the rib articulates with the transverse process of the thoracic vertebrae. The head of the rib is going to be articulating with the body of the thoracic vertebrae. The rib spins around like this, making a C. Remember, a clavicle would make more of an S. And we'll see this end that looks like it's been gnawed off. Let's see if we can zoom in on that. And this is referred to as the sternal end. So the sternal end is going to be attaching to the costal cartilages of the sternum. Let's take a quick look at the sternum. This is the sternum, and the very first thing I see on the sternum is the fact that there are all these brown structures, which of course are costal cartilages that are associated with ribs. There are seven true ribs, and each true rib has its own, own costal cartilage articulating with the sternum. 
Well, let's take a look. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven articulating cartilages that essentially have their own little place on the sternum. And so these are referred to as true ribs. Whereas down here we have one, two, three that join together with one cartilage articulating at one point on the sternum. And so these are three of the five false ribs. Now we'll be looking at the last two false ribs called floating ribs in just a moment. The two remaining ribs that have no costal cartilages associated with them are referred to as floating ribs. So we have one, two, three, four, five false ribs plus seven true ribs give us a total of 12 ribs altogether. Gorillas have 13 ribs. There are, however, of course, the same number of ribs in males and females. Occasionally you'll find somebody with 13 ribs, in which case we call this a gorilla rib, which means there's just no way of telling your friends from the apes. While we're at it, let's take a look at the sternum. This is the manubrium of the sternum, the gladiolus or body of the sternum, and the xiphoid process of the sternum. The sternum resembles a sword or a dagger. The term manubrium means handle, gladiolus means sword, and xiphoid process means point of a dagger. So, quite a weapon. 